This is Dr. Lara Hazelton. I'm the Director of Faculty Development for the Faculty of Medicine. I'm also a psychiatrist in my clinical practice. Welcome to Leadership PRN. This is the Faculty of Medicine's leadership podcast where I speak with new and emerging leaders, uh, both formal and informal, about their interests and their leadership journey. Today, I'm really excited to have with me Dr. Dave Bowes. Uh, you want to introduce yourself, Dave? Uh, sure, Laura. Uh, so I'm a, a radiation oncologist in Halifax. Uh, I'm a program director for the Radiation Oncology Residency Training Program, and I'm assistant dean of postgrad medicine here at Dell. And uh, before all of these things, I was a Dell med student and a, a resident at Dell as well. Thanks, Dave. I'm so pleased you're able to join me here today because I think you and I have known each other a while. Um, and uh, I've been involved with some of the educational programs that you put on for the residents. And I know that resident education and leadership is a real interest for, for you. Um, and I'm wondering, how did you get involved in uh, leadership education for residents? Uh, well, I, I was never really involved in leadership when I was a, a medical student or a resident. Um, I was always interested in medical education and interested in leadership in some ways, but I, I didn't really... Uh, engage with that much in that part of my training. Uh, I had a department head who was very supportive at the time and and um, encouraged me to seek out opportunities in leadership, knowing I was interested. Um, so when I became, I started here as a, a radiation oncologist, as a faculty person in 2011. And uh, I knew when I started that I would be taking on the role as residency program director shortly after I would start. So uh, my interest really arose out of that. Um, but I was given good advice to try and say yes to things to learn more about leadership. So there were some other opportunities that I took on through uh, undergraduate teaching, through teaching clinical skills uh, to med ones, uh, through lecturing as part of the, the med two oncology unit. Um, and I think starting as a, as a leader, I had never really managed anyone before. So it did force me to look into what um, my own needs were and, and to, to learn more, to read more. Uh, about leadership as a topic, and I, I developed, you know, the 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 understanding that I wish I had these things in my training, and um, I realized how important they were to to my, to my job. So uh, that became a real interest of mine over my time as program director, and um, I ended up seeking out other roles with the medical school that um, were were supportive of those interests. So I'm interested. You said that you knew when you were starting your faculty position that you were going to be the residency program director. Is that right? That, that's right. Yeah. How, how did that come about? Yeah. So um, I had actually done the medical education elective uh, when I was a resident, that there's a, a, an elective that a one month block elective that's still offered for Dal residents. Um, and as a resident in radiation oncology, it's a small program. Um, we're not like Department of Medicine or Department of Surgery, where there's big rounding teams that are working together with students and residents. So I thought, that I, I knew I would probably be super, when I was a resident, I figured that as a faculty person, I'd probably be supervising residents and I didn't really know how I would go about doing it. So I, I sought out the opportunity in, the, in that elective and that really got me interested in medical education more generally. Um, and then when I interviewed for a job here, it gave me some opportunities to, to, to or some um, ideas to speak about in that interview because um, it, the job was posted for someone with an interest in medical education. Um, so when I eventually transitioned into that role, uh, the people who were involved in medical education in, in my department really took me under their wing and slowly transitioned me in, into, their, into the job, um, got me exposed to more of the managerial aspects of being a residency program director, and that transition was extremely helpful. So I, I, I had about three years to, to ease myself into that, into that role, which was really important. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you kind of, you had this interest in medical education, and then the leadership part was part of the interest in medical education. Is that kind of what it was like for you? Yeah, I would say. And I think a lot of the skills that are involved in being a good teacher or an educator are, are leadership skills. And there's certain parts of leadership that I've, always, you know, that's a part of leadership that I've always gravitated towards. Not so much hospital administration, which I think is a very different kind of, of uh, leadership. I think it's important in leadership to, to to develop a sense of where your interests are mm. exactly beyond just doing leadership. Yeah. And you said you had um, some mentors who helped you along the way get familiar with the managerial aspects of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the challenging things, I, I knowing there's a difference between being a leader and being a manager, um, it's also important to be a manager. And we don't talk about developing those skills. I know 
um, thinking about medical education. We got rid of that role in can meds. It's no longer a petal on the, on the flower. Um, but you know, part of being a program director and some of the challenging things are, are like dealing with HR issues. Um, like how do you actually manage the, the people who are in your department? How do you, uh, work with your, your colleagues to deliver educational content and, and care? So it's not always about, you know, providing a vision or encouraging people or some of the skills that we do as a leader, but, um, I, I, it was, um, I guess a transition to realize that some of it is actually management as well. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do in your role as the uh, assistant dean PGME in terms of leadership education for residents? Yeah. So, so through my, my job in PGME, uh, it's the biggest part of it is overseeing the educational content for Dal residency programs. So we deliver a curriculum for programs, uh, which all residents can access uh, about a variety of topics that would be of interest to all residents. So as part of that, um, we, we offer uh, an online asynchronous leadership course, which is called ELAM, Emerging Leaders in Academic Medicine R for residents, uh, which you had developed the plain ELAM course. So this is a version for residents where um, they can participate in, in uh, readings, asynchronous um, like message boards. We usually have a speaker. So it's a nice way for residents who are interested to get their feet wet in leadership on top of uh, their regular work. Uh, this year, for the first time, we offered a leadership elective in the style of the medical education elective where residents were pulled from their, their regular service and they spent a month engaging entirely in leadership activities and not clinical activities. So we saw that as a way to uh, further people's interests in that, knowing that residents were interested in leadership, uh, but often did not have a, like a way to access training in it, or um, it wasn't really, it hasn't really been considered, uh, it, it's been considered, I would say, for many, uh, an afterthought as part of people's training because uh, people may not know how to teach leadership or there may not be, be ways to, to, to access it. And how has the, has there been interest in these? Have they been received? Yeah. So the, the e ELAM R is always a popular program and it's something that um, following along with it, usually I take part in the, as, as, you, as do you. Um, le leading the different units that are involved in that. And it's always interesting to see what residents say about leadership. And I always learn things uh, from residents who are involved in, in that course. I'd say the, the leadership elective was a big success. I'd say it, it was, there was more enthusiasm for it than maybe I realized that there would be. Uh, I thought people would be interested and would see it as being important, but I think people really valued having the time. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't say taken from their programs, but to have dedicated time to talk about issues that are important in leadership. Uh, residents are very busy in their clinical jobs, so it's hard to develop programming, which residents maybe are doing when they're on a post-call day, or maybe they're coming from the OR, you know, to go to a half day session on something, but they're maybe distracted, may not truly be able to get away. So it's, I think it, it was good that people had the time to, to actually devote to it. And um, you're content planning to continue offering these in years to come. We are. Yeah. Yeah. I think it will evolve. You know, I don't know that it's going to exist in the same format in the future, just de depending on on the, on the feedback that we get. But we are planning to offer the elective again next year. What do you think are some of the most important elements to include in resident um, education and leadership? I think any kind of programming has to uh, acknowledge that physicians have a very stressful job, that they get, they're under pressure from all angles, from their patients, from their uh, system, from their colleagues. So um, any kind of programming needs to recognize that uh, as leaders, we need to be vulnerable. Uh, we need to be aware of our own personal wellness and the wellness and, as others. I mean, I'm sure that's important in other fields as well, but I think it's especially important in medicine, given the type of work that we do. Um, another unique thing about leadership for physicians or leadership for residents is how strongly the hierarchy um, plays into everything that we do and everything that we consider. And I think we're socialized that way as physicians to be very respectful of hierarchy and um, being cautious of crossing boundaries or speaking up, you know, against people we might perceive to have authority. So um, it's important for residents to develop the skills to be able to do that effectively uh, if they want to create change. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that, how the hierarchy plays out, what residents might need to navigate? Yeah. So um, there's, there's a real culture in being aware of our position relative to the other people that we work with. So say as a medical student, and I think people 
often after a couple of years in the system become hyper aware of this, that as a medical student, uh, you may have a junior resident working above you and there's a senior resident working above that person. And there's a, a faculty person who's at the top of the chain uh, who, you know, everything rains down from that person, both good and bad. Um, so if I were a, a junior resident, for example, I may, if I was unsure about something, I may perceive the senior resident as being kind of my most important authority figure. Uh, and I may ask that person the question or make the suggestion to that person. I would never dream of crossing the senior resident to go directly to the faculty person. Or similar for a medical student, maybe the junior resident is their authoritative figure. I, I remember very distinctly uh, starting a uh, clerkship and doing a psychiatry rotation. Uh, and I think it was my first rotation in the hospital system. So this was very new to me. And I'd heard from my classmates what the hierarchy was like and what uh, what I was allowed to do and wasn't allowed to do. So there's a whole hidden curriculum about that. But I remember there was a, a PGY2 psychiatry re resident who was on the rotation with me, who was excellent and very supportive and really enjoyed working with this person. And I thought that person was God. I, I, they, to me, they were the most senior authoritative figure that had ever walked into the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so as leaders, you know, it's important that resident leaders learn to you know, speak up against that because if, if we're, there's very negative aspects to hierarchy. I mean, there are, are probably some positive aspects to it as well. Uh, but, you know, as we transition and as residents transition to faculty roles, they have to be aware of what impact the hierarchy has on the people working. I shouldn't say below, but below them on the hierarchy or what may perceive as being below, because um, I think people can get into trouble when they're not aware of the way that may they may be perceived in this hierarchy. Like it, it's people can cross boundaries or, or they may, you know, not be aware of the environment that they're creating. That's a really good point. I, I read something once that talked about how um, differences in status are more obvious to the people in the lower status position than the people in the higher status position, that people in higher status positions don't realize how intimidating they can be or how other people might be perceiving them. They think we're all kind of friends here together, but it's more obvious to maybe the learners that uh, there is this this status difference. Yeah. I, and I, may, I, I hear it in my colleagues um, and probably myself who may say, like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't anyone approach me with something? I'm approachable. And um, they should have come to me if they thought this, that this was a problem. But really, um, there are many reasons why they are probably not doing that. And it's not necessarily the, the person at the top of the hierarchy's fault. It's, you know, the system that, that we're trained in. At the same time, there can be a sort of status threat when residents do challenge their, their, their staff people. So I, th I think it is a good topic for residents to figure out how to negotiate that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's, I think it's probably similar in a lot of fields. But um, I, I think part of why it's important to have leadership training for physicians specifically is that I think this impacts physicians in their place in the healthcare system in a different way that it, than it impacts a lot of other people. Are there other elements that you think are important? I think there, there's, it's important that we talk about personal time management, knowing how busy physicians are and balancing uh, clinical roles with non-clinical roles. So when people take on leadership roles or they say, maybe they say yes to being on a committee, for example, if they're uh, learning, wanting to become more interested in leadership, they may not realize how it's going to impact their clinical work or their day-to-day -day lives. So uh, setting boundaries on that is important. And for me, that was uh, uh, something I'm still learning to do, uh, to try and provide myself space to do my clinical work and my leadership work. Um, so um, I don't think there's a lecture that you can receive on how to set boundaries that will allow you to set boundaries uh, effectively. But um, that does look different for physicians, I think, just because of the way our roles are, are blended. Yeah, absolutely. I think having that sense of where your boundaries are, what you want out of life, what your values are, and how you can incorporate your life into your work and vice versa, right? It's an important thing for everybody to know. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been involved in this teaching space for a while now, and I, I was struck by a comment you made about, we don't always feel like we know how to teach leadership. I think that is a, a challenge. As a leadership educator, um, what approaches do you find most effective for teaching leadership? There's leadership training that's formal, that's effective and important. And there's also 
informal day-to-day leadership training that we need to expose residents to. So thinking about if we're, if we're doing lectures or workshops or more didactic forms of, of teaching, uh, when we're teaching residents, it's, it's important that this type of work is interactive and, and that uh, it allows contributions from residents and cases and ways for people to discuss things that I think residents learn better from that than they do from sitting down to a lecture, for example. Um, that residents are practical people and any kind of teaching needs to uh, needs to reflect that. I'll say role, sometimes the question will come up, well, what about role playing or communication skills? And I think that's an effective way to teach as well, although I'll just point out for the listeners that residents tend not to like that because it pushes that, and I don't like that either. Um, it can push people beyond the, the, their comfort zone, but it is actually, I think it is, it is an effective way of teaching it, even though, you know, so, just recognizing some of the things that, that are effective in teaching aren't necessarily uh, comfortable. Right. That's interesting, actually, because um, our associate dean for CPD, uh, Dr. Stephen Miller, um, is very interested in simulation. I think he's actually looking at ways that we could do uh, leadership education, not just with residents, but using simulation s- situations. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I, I've done some communication skills training, which has used simulation, which um, is always uncomfortable as someone who doesn't like to be watched doing things all the time. But it is a very effective way of, of uh, learning. I think we, we overlook the opportunities in our day-to-day work as teachers to teach leadership as well. So, um, you know, as a program director, there are lots of, I see that there are lots of opportunities in my program, and it's probably the same in every program, for residents to become involved in the administrative work of the department, uh, to sit on committees. Um, as a program director, I see the things in my program that need to be changed and policies that need to be made. And these are lots of opportunities for, for residents to become engaged in that work and learn how to change something or learn how to uh, ar- respectfully argue with a hospital administrative person to help enact some kind of change. So it's really important that we seize on these opportunities and we don't always think about that because we may see this as like an add-on to our regular work and everyone's busy, everyone has lots of things to do, but um, we do have to try and incorporate these things into our work if we want to train leaders appropriately. Look for the teachable moments. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I think for this, you really have to seek these things out. I think um, sometimes asking a resident who's on a committee to take a turn chairing a meeting um, sometime or, or providing feedback to them on their skills at, at chairing rounds or something. The, those natural occurring occasions are a great opportunity for teaching leadership. Exactly. I, I always thought that came naturally, that that was a natural skill, but I, I learned from Elam that it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and I got better at chairing meetings when I sought out resources to, to uh, do that. Oh, I think we've both been at enough poorly run committees and meetings over the years. So everyone's got a story about a bad meeting. <laughs> That's so, right. Yeah. And I just just to add that um, research is also a great opportunity for people to get involved in leadership. So um, pretty much every resident and every program will have to do a research project and people may take on more than one. And traditionally, we may have thought of that as a chart review or some kind of study or or like a clinical topic. But uh, there's really no reason why people can't consider a leadership topic to be a good research project or a quality improvement topic to be a good research project. So that's a great way to get people, to get residents involved in leadership as well. So many re- leaders um, or many residents don't anticipate that they're going to have a formal leadership uh, position. You kind of knew before you started. But um, do you think that all residents, and in fact all physicians, should have some leadership training regardless of whether they have a formal leadership position or not? Uh, yes, yes, I do. And I think I think if, if we worked in a perfect system where there was no change that was ever going to be needed, and if the healthcare, you know, if healthcare just ran without physician involvement perfectly and everything was hunky-dory, then um, yeah, leadership would not be required amongst physicians, amongst all physicians. But really, every physician will have to take on some kind of leadership role in their career. Um, and it may not be involved being like the president of something or a department head or division head or something like that. But uh, there are leadership skills that are needed if there's um, something happening in your clinic and you want to, you want to change it, or if there's a new procedure you want to do. You've got, when I, when I started as a faculty person, there was a new procedure that we wanted to take on. uh, And I figured that we would just start doing it and everyone would be happy, but uh, we needed to get approval from all the layers of uh, hospital leadership, need to involve anesthesia, sterile processing, recovery room, all these people that I never really would have thought about. And all that required project management skills and 
uh, the ability to chair meetings and uh, to work together with a team and, and encountering various obstacles to, to change. So um, people will do these things if they're in their jobs, if they want healthcare to improve. You know, if, if, if a physician has a career that lasts 20, 30 years, um, things are not going to stay static. So we have to be able to adapt to, to, to that kind of change and push that kind of change because that's really has to be driven by, by uh, you know, if you want your job to change or improve, then it really has to come from you. When you reflect on your leadership journey, what advice would you give your younger self? When I was a resident and medical student even, I, I knew I was kind of interested in leadership, but I was always a little bit afraid to put myself out there and put my name in for different roles. And uh, I just did not see myself as that kind of person. But I think it is important to do that sometimes because that will open up opportunities, even if it's uncomfortable and it's outside of your, your comfort zone. So um, pushing yourself a little bit to take on extra things is okay. It's important to say yes to things. We get lots of advice about saying no to things and only doing things when there's room on our plate. But many of the things I'm doing in my career now are happening because I said yes to something before it. So, um, and it is good advice not to overburden yourself and not to, t which is why we talk about boundaries and, and trying, knowing when to draw the line between your clinical work and leadership work. And you can't work more than one FTE, but, um, you do, it is good to say yes to things that you're truly interested in. And I received that advice when I was a resident and that was very important advice. My ex department head, Dr. Uh, Tete Ago, who uh, is now retired, always said, you know, if you if you're interested in medical education, then say yes to things at the medical school and the medical school will get back to you. There's lots of opportunities there. So uh, that was great advice for someone who was interested in medical education. I think that's really true. What is the saying something about success is 80 percent showing up or something? Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes just putting your your name out there and getting to know people, opportunities lead to opportunities. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing what the system is like, like knowing what the system is like, if you're interested in hospital administration, for example. Um, being on committees or saying yes to some of these opportunities, it may not necessarily lead to something else, but you may know more about how the system works. You may know more about how and why people make decisions. Um, you'll get to meet people outside of your immediate day-to-day -day work, which is really important. So I probably didn't do that enough early in my career or when I was a resident, try and seek out, I don't know if I'd say mentors, but try and build relationships with people outside of my you know, immediate day-to-day -day work in my department. Because that's, that's really important too. And those are good resources for, for you to use down the road. Thanks so much for joining us today, uh, Dave. It's been really great to, to talk with you and find out a little bit about um, what you've been doing in leadership and uh, really value your contributions, not only to the resident leadership education, but also to our faculty development program. You've been a moderator for our ELAM course, and it's very much appreciated. Great. Thanks for having me. So this brings us to the end of another uh, episode of uh, Leadership PRN. I'd like to thank the crew at MedIT for helping us put this together and also David Bowes for joining us today. If you have a topic you'd like to see here covered or if there's somebody you'd like me to interview or if you'd like to be interviewed yourself, please feel free to reach out to me. It's lara.hazelton at dal.ca or lara.hazelton at nshealth. And thanks again for listening and see you next time.